Hello, A pushers. Let's get going. It's week two of the COVID crisis. We are getting more into off of this stock market crash of 1929. We're getting to the Great Depression, the Dust Bowl, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and the New Deal. Okay. Now, I want you to pay attention because I'm going to be asking you to take kind of a series of steps this week. Okay. I am just about to hit post on your work for the week. Um, Guys, it looks a little something like this here, all right? I want you to begin to watch this lecture video, okay? And pause as we get into some other activities. Uh, I will tell you when you should pause my video and go watch a YouTube video I've embedded into Google Classroom on the Great Depression, followed immediately by a YouTube video on the Dust Bowl. Then you'll come back as I explain for just the length of two slides how I want you to get into a reading from an excerpt uh, from one of the greatest books I've ever read called The Boys in the Boat. I am then sending you to an assignment on Padlet, uh, and I've linked that as well. I'm sure a lot of you have used that at Cardinal Givens before. Then I'm asking you to come back into the video lecture as I talk a little bit more about FDR before I pause you and send you back out for another video, this time posted through an MP4 on Franklin Delano Roosevelt as president. Part one, part two will come next week. You will uh, finally then finish the video lecture. And you will use all of that information that you are getting into your class notes, uh, along with any other outside information you might use, maybe your textbook and other sources as well, to complete your assignment this week, which is the uh, FDR New Deal Alphabet Soup assignment. But I don't want you just to skip to that assignment, okay? I want you to go through the steps, and I want you to join me in Zoom. Uh, as you are scheduled in your class. Remember, we go at 10 a.m. at your scheduled time, period two. That's 10 a.m. on Monday, period eight, 10 a.m. on Thursday, and period seven, 10 a.m. on Friday, okay? So again, stock market crash, Great Depression, Dust Bowl, FDR, the New Deal. We remember that the causes of the Great Depression, was it was not caused by Black Tuesday, okay? It was caused by underlying markers uh, of a very serious nature in the American economy. Agricultural overproduction uh, as a result of World War I, and that demand uh, immediately dries up upon the conclusion of the war, and the United States is now an isolated nation. Okay, so there's less foreign trade uh, for agricultural uh, produce. Uh, there are depressed labor markets as that progressivism era has ended and the pendulum has swung back in favor of uh, American corporatism. Remember, we talked about a return to normalcy with the Republican conservative presidents of the 1920s. Uh, deflation uh, with respect to wages an uneven distribution of wealth, uh, and especially in urban America, um, a big red flag of reliance on credit, including buying stock on margin. Uh, so when the stock market does crash, uh, the banks are left high and dry. They are not collecting the loans that they are owed from uh, the people who are uh, taking that money out to buy stock and then the stock market crashes and, and they're out bubbly. Okay. Uh, and there are other international economic problems with respect to, we talked about, you know, the war reparations Germany had to pay and all that. So the Great Depression was really set up by some underlying difficulties in the American economy. And then we get to the stock market crash, Black Tuesday, 1929. And remember now we're in this string of conservative Republican presidents culminating with Herbert Hoover, who as a rugged individualist, 
uh, his first inclination is to go back and try to help the corporations. He raises tariffs. It only has a negative effect. Um, this trickle-down economic theory does not work uh, during the Hoover administration, okay? And we talked about that last week. We talked about what bad optics it was uh, when some of those people living in these uh, derisively named Hoovervilles, uh, the homeless people who had lost everything, um, are World War veterans that are seeking their wartime bonuses for World War I, uh, you know, essentially hazard pay, right? Uh, and Hoover breaks up their marches and their essentially homeless camps in Washington, D.C., uh at the tip of bayonets and uh the threat and actual throwing of tear gas okay uh and so hoover is in a bad place when he runs for re-election in 1932 and that is where um franklin delano roosevelt comes into the picture uh he is the democratic candidate he promises a new deal remember uh, Teddy Roosevelt, his distant cousin, had the square deal. Franklin Delano Roosevelt, FDR, has the new deal for Americans. Um, we may not be aware as kind of general, we, we might have an idea what that means, but that there's no real clear plan laid out. It's just kind of this series of promises that FDR makes. Uh, but in light of the fact that there's an overwhelming 25% unemployment rate, and incredible frustration with the Hoover administration, um, FDR has enough to win this election of 1932, okay? And so we're going to get in today, uh, FDR and his New Deal. Um, it's absolutely historically significant for our purposes. We may or may not question how much it really brought the nation out of the Great Depression. Uh, but certainly FDR gets a lot of credit uh, and it absolutely changes American government, uh, probably really on, on a permanent basis. And so we want to understand what this is all about. OK, but I also want us to understand kind of some of the imagery that takes place during the Great Depression, um, which is also tied in with uh, what is known as the Dust Bowl, which is like this once in you know, a, 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 like a 10,000 year kind of event, this severe, massive drought that takes place throughout the American Midwest. And it's really just uh, wreaks havoc. It's unbelievable damage throughout the, uh, you know, the breadbasket of America. And combined with what's happening uh, with the Great Depression, the imagery of the you know, kind of the early to mid 1930s is, you know, <sighs> unbelievable uh, what these people, uh, our, you know, predecessors, fellow Americans had to live through. Um, any sacrifice that we're asked to make today pales in comparison to what this generation uh, grew up with uh, and through during the Great Depression and the Dust Bowl. And I really do want us to, to get a really fair understanding of what that looked like and what that felt like, okay? So, especially with respect to the Dust Bowl that you may have written about or uh, read about, excuse me, in uh, The Gra Grapes of Wrath by John Steinbeck. I don't know if you all still read that in English class. Um, but it spells out, gives some good imagery there. Um, I want us to understand what it looked like through a couple of videos. So right now I would ask you to essentially pause this video and go watch first uh, the YouTube video on the Great Depression and secondly, the YouTube video on the Dust Bowl. Okay, so um, pause that get to those videos, and then come back to me here, all right? Okay, so assuming you paused, watched those videos, uh, you have an appreciation for 
uh, some of what, again, our, uh, our our predecessor Americans went through during the Great Depression and the era of the Dust Bowl. Um, there's also uh, another opportunity that I would be remiss if I didn't give us, um, and it's uh, an excerpt, just a couple pages from what I think is arguably the best book that I have ever read in my life. Um, the book is called The Boys in the Boat. And it tells the story of a couple main characters in particular, but of a team of nine Americans um, that are going for gold at the 1936 Berlin Olympics. They're looking to win a medal under the watchful eye of Adolf Hitler and crew. And these are, again, young men that grew up during the Great Depression. They came of age. Uh, during the Dust Bowl. Uh, and this is an autobiogra- autobiographical account of what it is that they had to live through. And so what I would ask you to do with this reading should probably only take maybe 15, 20 minutes to please um, read, annotate, kind of digest, uh, really truly see if you can develop an appreciation for what these men lived through, these Americans lived through. Okay. So read, annotate, digest it, appreciate it. Um, And when you're done with the reading, I would ask you to go to the Padlet link that I have provided for you here and linked to Google Classroom as well. And what we're gonna try to do between all three of my A-Push classes, we're gonna try to have one big kind of think, pair, share. So what I have asked you to do there, uh, read the post and listen to the voice recording I've attached to the post on the Padlet when you open it up. I've asked you to write two questions, okay, about the reading. One is a level two question where you're essentially, remember, to compare, contrast, to analyze, to evaluate. One is a level three question where you're asked to kind of personalize the reading, to predict, to imagine if, to kind of create a scenario. You're really kind of um, writing a level two question in order to build more empathy uh, with the material, okay? Uh, And then I am asking you to respond to other people's questions or other people's comments on some other questions. And I would like to see if we can have kind of a large kind of silent Padlet discussion on this reading. Okay. So again, please read the excerpt that I have provided from Boys in the Boat. Okay. Digest it, annotate it, uh, personalize your understanding of it and then talk about it through questions and through answers uh, through the Padlet assignment that I have linked here, okay? When you're done with that, I want you to come back to this video here. So pause me and go do that now, please. All right. Assuming you uh, have gone in there and you may need to go back, by the way, right? Because if you were the first one to go, there's probably not much else to do. You know, you you can't respond to anyone else. So please keep an eye on that tab. Um, Go back there. Maybe when I'm done with uh, the continuation of the the lecture, uh, if you will, that I want to get through here with respect to FDR, the New Deal and how this president tried to tackle Uh, the problems America was facing in the early to mid-1930s in particular uh, as a result of the Great Depression and the Dust Bowl, okay? So a little on FDR. Uh, Yeah, FDR uh, does uh, come from kind of a a wealthy, privileged family, Um, family of a a president, right? Uh, But Polio had le- had left uh, FDR, Franklin uh, himself, paralyzed from the waist down. Uh, he marries a great woman. Eleanor Roosevelt is among the, the best first ladies that this country has ever seen, and I would venture to say ever will see. Uh, she absolutely recreates the position of first lady in America. Um, from just being, you know, kind of outside of the president to really kind of creating some 
uh, important programs that the First Lady oversees. Uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt also does a great job of bringing in others. They, he calls it his brain trust, uh, other advisors to really help him because, again, now the United States is grappling with issues uh, at the beginning of his tenure uh, that they had never seen before in, in 1933 as a result of the Great Depression and, and the Dust Bowl. Um, it's notable, too, that among his cabinet picks is uh, the first woman ever chosen for a presidential cabinet. Frances Perkins serves as uh, his secretary of labor, which is an incredibly important position given the historical context of what's happening in America at this time. So what is the New Deal? Well, surprisingly, maybe, as I said earlier, it's not necessarily this kind of organized, pre-planned set of programs. It's this, I would maybe hesitate, but almost dare to say this hodgepodge where FDR is kind of taking shots at what, you know, what's going to stick, what's going to fix all of the problems in the American economy. Um, and he really is demonstrating a willingness to experiment with the intervention of the federal government to fix what's happening in America. And guys, if you will recall, that is the classic definition of progressivism, right? The utilization of government as a tool to affect positive change in the lives of the people. And FDR uh, is using the government in any kind of, by any means necessary. Um, but he focuses on the three R's, relief, recovery, and reform, okay? Relief for the people that are struggling from unemployment and debt and homelessness, uh, a general kind of sense of recovery for the economy at large, and some reform measures to make sure that that crash that happened, that, you know, those pillars of sand that the economy was built on in the 1920s, we don't just rebuild that same way. OK, uh, and so the New Deal is often marked by these alphabet agencies. Some call them kind of alphabet soup. OK, um, and uh, FDR receives some criticism for a lot of what he does here uh, because it's again, it's this kind of uh, swinging to progressivism after this period of, of Republican conservative normalcy. Um, and in an era when a lot of Americans are still afraid of socialism, uh, he has got to explain to the American people um, what he's doing and why he's doing it and, and kind of justify himself. And he is uh, a revolutionary in terms of communicating with the American people. Uh, through his fireside chats, radio addresses, where he's talking to the American people on like a regular kind of like weekly basis, where he's explaining to them what he's doing. He's explaining to us, the common people, what he's doing, why he's doing it, what this agency does, what that agency does, and how it's going to serve his objectives, uh, you know, especially with respect to one of those three R's for each and every program that he creates, okay? And he goes about setting uh, what he calls the 100 days, right? Starting March 4, 1933, um, that he implements quickly uh, a barrage of legislation coming from the executive branch and being passed by Congress to tackle the problems in uh, the American economy. Now, this is somewhat arbitrary, right? 100 days. You know, what does that really mean? Um, grand scheme of things, probably not that much, but FDR changes American politics forever. Ever since then, you will hear every single American president talk about, the media will ask them about, what are you going to do in the first 100 days? What are you going to do in the first 100 days? And the president will say, in my first 100 days, I promise you're going to watch the debates this fall and Trump or, you know, Biden or whoever's running against him will say, I'm going to do X, Y, and Z in the first 100 days. That was something that was never talked about until FDR came along, okay? Uh, but he wants to give the American people this comforting sense that, hey, the federal government is in charge, and the federal government's going to fix what's happening here, and this new deal uh, will be brought to the American people, and it's going to start in the first 100 days, and he goes right after, like I said, kind of a barrage of legislation, okay? Uh, so what does he accomplish? Um, 
what kind of measures are we talking about here? Uh, one thing is that um, because the banks are failing, remember, okay, um, he calls for a bank holiday. So in March of 1933, we're in his first 100 days, he calls for a four days off a of bank. All the banks are closed, okay? And that's going to give him the executive branch and the legislative branch time to come up with a plan. There's going to be no more runs on the banks, okay? Uh, and by the time the banks open again, there's going to be a plan in place, all right? Um, while he and Congress act, the banks are shut down for four days, and that's like immediately upon his being put into office. He wants to restore confidence in the banking industry for the American people. And again, he goes on to these fireside chats and he explains to the American people what's happening. Uh, FDR does an outstanding job as a communicator and in terms of getting the American people kind of on board with his vision, okay? Um, these would be, uh, you know, as we talk about the, uh, the three R's, these would fall under reform. OK, so he comes out with the, uh, you know, what how to prevent the problems that happened during uh, the Great Depression from happening again. The Emergency Banking Relief Act or is, is 1933, part of his first hundred days. OK, um, that when he goes back to opening up the banks, only they, they, they figure out what banks are financially solvent, stable, and those ones open up again. Um, the Glass-Steagall Act regulates how banks can invest customer deposits so that um, they can't take your money as a customer and put it into funds that are too risky, investing them kind of the wrong way, okay, um, so that your money will be there. And then he makes a promise uh, that they will be there with the FDIC, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, which says, and now it, you know, it goes through revisions, but I think it's up to something like $250,000 or something like that per account. You as a bank customer are guaranteed that your money will be there. It is backed by the federal government, okay? Uh, he establishes the Securities and Exchange Commission, the SEC, not the Athletic Conference, but the Government Oversight Committee on Wall Street, regulating how stock market uh, functions, how Wall Street acts, okay? So right off the bat, he, he recognizes that we need to reform the banking industry through governmental action. We talk about a progressive here, yeah? He also uh, seeks, uh, again, relief, right, for those people that are struggling. Um, 25% unemployment rate, millions of people are unemployed. So the New Deal creates jobs uh, to assist these people. Um, job creation at the hands of the United States government. We see, I'm gonna move my, uh, my camera here. Uh, the United States Civ Civilian Conservation Corps is one's the CCC, we talk about alphabet soup, is one such agency um, that employs men in uh, park work park maintenance, building parks, reforestation projects, all these sorts of things, okay? Uh, the PWA, the Public Works Administration, gives federal money to state and local government for other works projects, okay? That, so municipalities can build um, needs with respect to infrastructure and put men at work in building those projects, okay? Um, the Federal Emergency Relief Act just gives money to state and local government so that they can spend it as they see fit where they can best help their local communities and put men at work. So there's a number of these objectives that um, are really quite successful in terms of providing that first R relief, okay? Um, and you see a couple of them up there on your screen. Um, we also see uh, recovery, right, addressed with the National Recovery Act um, that uh, seeks to... Um, bring life back into the industrial economy. Uh, that's a little bit more progressive in terms of providing fair wages um, and hours, again, for workers. We had gone through that in the progressive era a little bit, but then I'd gotten away from it, okay? Um, the uh, draft codes that set kind of uh, wages and hours and production limits and that sort of thing, okay? Uh, the Agricultural Adjustment Act actually pays farmers to cut production and increase prices. 
Remember, that had been a problem with the agricultural economy going all the way back towards, uh, you know, the populist era of the Gilded Age, right? Um, that the farmers were in great debt, but there is all sorts of overproduction, uh, especially with the advent of the technology that was becoming available to them at the time. Uh, and the only thing they felt like they could do to make more money was to produce more crops, uh, to farm more. And that would further deflate the uh, the prices. You remember that in the populist era, uh, the you know they want bimetallism. They wanted to kind of artificially inflate prices. We see the same thing. We talked about it already. The end of World War One, the agricultural uh, uh, sector is overproducing. Okay, and so in order to raise prices, the Agricultural Adjustment Act kind of takes the incentive away from farmers to kind of try to spin their wheels to get out of their problems. Uh, and they pay them to actually cut production, okay? Um, and so this is called a subsidy program. The subsidies still exist in a number of uh, agricultural markets throughout the United States today, okay? Where it's essentially government intervention in the marketplace uh, of agricultural production. So, you know, FDR is still with us here, okay? Um, I think one of the most famous uh, initiatives of the New Deal is the Tennessee Valley Authority, or the TVA, which was very significant uh, right here in North Carolina, uh, all the way out, as you'll see on this map here, uh, especially through Tennessee. Uh, but remember that while America had made this shift to becoming an urban nation, uh, and we talked about kind of the image of the roaring 20s and what America looked like. Um, but how much that imagery excluded the poor um, and excluded rural America and, and therefore also excluded poor rural America. So there's uh, a number of Americans that are essentially living in the relative Stone Ages compared to what urban America is going through. They have no electricity. Um, there is no kind of running water, okay? Uh, and so the TVA, the Tennessee Valley Authority, is a government agency throughout the region you see on your map uh, that comes in and builds dams and power plants and chemical plants and brings uh, power and electricity and running water throughout this entire region. And take a look at that map. That includes cities like Asheville, North Carolina, Knoxville, Tennessee, Bristol, Virginia, uh, Chattanooga, Tennessee. Um, it's an amazing program, perhaps one of the most well-known programs of FDR's New Deal, the Tennessee Valley Authority. Okay. Uh, after FDR's first couple years of the New Deal, uh, we get to what we call the second New Deal. Okay. Um, and it's really is largely a continuation of the same. Uh, there were absolutely some successes in FDR's new deal. Um, and then in 1935, uh, the second new deal aims to go even further with both reform and relief. Uh, the works progress administration or the WPA, you see a poster here for the WTA It says work pays America. Okay. And we're building prosperity. Um, spends billions of dollars employing um, the, the millions upon millions of Americans that remain unemployed uh, from coast to coast. Um, building, again, public work. So uh, really, uh, we're, we're talking classic progressivism, the government getting involved in building. And we build up America uh, significantly during FDR's tenure in the, in the presidency, okay? Uh, he's also got a long tenure in the presidency, right? He is uh, the only president to serve more than two terms, four terms, FDR served. But we'll talk about that a little bit later because he's the president for 16 years. That spanned a lot of uh, history from the New Deal up until getting into, you know, uh, World War II when we get there next week. Um, the Resettlement Administration provides loans to 
talk about the rural poor, we're still in an era where, you know, never mind the flappers, we've got former sharecroppers, tenant farmers, small farmers, okay, um, that need desperately need help from the American government and, and FDR is here for them. Uh, FDR establishes the Social Security Fund, okay, the Social Security Act of 1935 uh, that is still now it's known today as like the third rail of American politics. You do not mess with social security in America. Um, I don't know that I'm really counting on seeing social security myself. Um, right. But, uh, this is, uh, intended to assist in, uh, the funding of retirements for a number of Americans. One generation pays in for, uh, you know, for, um, the next generation uh, to benefit from. It's uh, money taken from the payroll of employees, uh, employers, okay? And when you reach uh, retirement age 65, some proposals had that, you know, becoming 70 now, uh, you can kind of dip into Social Security and get a government check during uh, during your golden years. But that is, uh, that's a, an FDR uh, move right there, okay? Um, to benefit the labor movement, all right? Um, FDR protects as a progressive would with the Wagner Act of 1935, uh, guarantees the rights of organized labor, okay? So we see a return because of FDR's presidency, because of FDR's New Deal to uh, a protection of the labor union. And as, you know, America had, we talked last week about how there was kind of a fear of socialism with um, labor unions and, and they had declined, uh, you know, during that first red scare. Okay. Uh, FDR seeks to kind of remove that fear and says there is a place for labor unions in America and the Wagner act guarantees their rights and, and unions under the Wagner act get the right to, uh, bargain collectively. Um, he creates the NLRB, the national labor relations board. And I, I, and there I am using, you know, some of the alphabet language. Okay. But this is uh, a, a monumental boost to the labor movement uh, during uh, FDR's administration. Okay, uh, very much again, kind of a progressive, a modern progressive era uh, reform that we see taking place here under FDR. Now there are some challenges, right, to uh, uh, to FDR's New Deal. Um, the economy does remain a little bit unstable. Conservatives absolutely do not like FDR. Uh, conservatives still today would probably take exception to how FDR uh, went about his recovery programs, this sense of big government intervention, okay? Uh, business owners may not like him because his legislation favored the little people, didn't favor the corporation, remember? And and that return to normalcy of the 1920s, I had told you last week, was more like, hey, the, the, the business of America is business. Uh, you know, the, the, the government should be helping business. Well, progressives don't feel that way. Uh, business owners, conservatives, they don't like the kind of regulation and the increasing size of government that uh, takes place under FDR's administration. Um, but what FDR is following here is what we call Keynesian economics. Uh, John Maynard Keynes, okay, uh, argues, he's a British economist, he argues that deficit spending is needed to stimulate the uh, economic growth. So that's the government kind of uh, demonstrating a willingness to go into debt to stimulate the private sector economy. Um, and that's called Keynesian economics. FDR absolutely buys into that. Uh, liberal critics may not say, you know, say that FDR is not doing enough for minority communities, okay, even the really poor. So, again, let's put this, like, put the brakes on here just for a hot second. We're in the 1930s, okay? That is still big time Jim Crow era uh, America, and a lot of uh, liberals, okay, progressives would make the argument that once again, we have a progressive movement that's largely excluding African Americans and other minority communities, okay? Um, so there are a number of challenges to the New Deal uh, that, that that takes place, okay? Um, and, uh, 
And we can probably have an argument over how necessary the New Deal was with respect to some programs or, or others, uh, that maybe the economy would eventually go through its cyclical bounce back, okay, uh, from a from a trough to a peak once again. Um, but certainly, FDR's New Deal is incredibly important to understanding uh, what was happening in the wake of the Great Depression and the Dust Bowl in America. Now, FDR, who I said is you know the only uh, president to uh, serve more than two terms, um, also uh, received some criticism for what they say is a uh, a court packing plan, right? Um, so the Supreme Court had ruled that a couple of uh, FDR's New Deal programs were unconstitutional. Um, and in response to that, and, you know, trying to keep his vision for recovery and his philosophy on progressive government alive, uh, FDR comes up with a plan to allow him to uh, appoint additional Supreme Court justices. Okay. Um, it's called a court packing plan. Uh, you'll see a little bit more. Pay attention to that cartoon right there. And, and you know, you, you see what the Supreme Court had ruled is, is out. But Teddy Roosevelt is there. You know, listen, I don't like your decisions. From now on, you're going to have to work with someone who can see things my way. And, and both Democrats and Republicans see uh, this as a, uh, a check upon the constitutional checks and balances that Americans are so fond of in our Constitution. Uh, it is a uh, significant, if rare, political defeat. Okay, but all in all, uh, JFK, or sorry, FDR is uh, widely viewed as uh, a very strong popular, well-liked president. Um, he certainly is divisive uh, in the kind of progressive versus conservative battle that we still see in place in American politics, uh, but undeniably notable, undeniably charismatic, a great communicator, revolutionary with his fireside chats, uh, and he's able to overcome some of those rare political defeats that he suffers. Uh, we will talk more about FDR because, well, 16 years, there's more to talk about. OK, um, the impact of the New Deal, as I said, is. Absolutely notable. OK, um, it is coalesces the Democratic Party among farmers and uh, union members, uh, urban America, immigrants. Um, it establishes the federal government as having a role with respect to providing the safety net. That's what, when you hear safety net in American politics, you're probably talking about social security. Um, but it does not end the Great Depression. It stems the tide. Absolutely. There's no arguing that. Um, but I think a lot of people would say, well, the New Deal ended the Great Depression. And that's really not the case. Um, we have talked a couple of times now how war really, for better or worse, whether you like it or you don't, war is a boost to the American economy. And um, and that's certainly what we see when America is ultimately drawn into World War II, which remember, we had tried to stay out of. Uh, because in the wake of World War One, right, we were an isolationist nation. The Republican Congress had rejected uh, Democrat Woodrow Wilson's uh, proposal for this League of Nations. And uh, America had become an island and stayed an island in large part until, spoiler alert, we're kind of sucker punched into World War Two. Uh, and that really is what we see as ending the Great Depression. Um, but let's talk about what the New Deal did do, okay? And so in order to do that, um, I do have a, uh, an assignment for you on Google Classroom. It's called FDR's New Deal Alphabet Soup. 
I want you to become familiar with a number of the more important uh, alphabet agencies uh, that uh, FDR created uh, during, uh, especially his first term, and 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 then the second New Deal, okay, uh, beginning in 1935. But we should know by acronym a lot of these agencies, and maybe we should apply some of our own thinking to what do you think was important, uh, what was maybe not so important, okay? Um, watch that video first, okay, uh, on FDR. Do that New Deal worksheet. Take these notes. Do these things in the order I told you to do, and then we will Zoom next week. That's all I got for you today, guys. And uh, I'll look forward to seeing you on Zoom. Take care.